YouTube, it's me, Tara, the Mud Creek Stitcher. I am back. Surprise! It's been two weeks, and uh, it is, I wrote this down because I was going to forget. It is April 2nd. I knew I was going to forget. Uh, 2023, this is my Floss Tube channel, which I started back in November, so I'm still very new at this. And I talk a lot about cross stitch. I have mentioned and shown a little bit of my quilting, and then, um, the second part of this, I spend time with scripture, and today we're starting a Bible study, so yay! But if you're not interested in any of that, then just move on, I guess. Um, so anyways, it's been two weeks since I was back, and um, just life updates. Kids are nuts. That's all I can tell you. Uh, my little kiddos that I'm teaching in second grade are... They're going nuts, I'm pretty sure. And I have cracked, and I officially turned into a nut by Friday afternoon. I don't know what it is about this time of year, but oh my gosh. And it's not just students and teachers. I mean, parents are just kind of like, oh, my kid, what is going on? And we're all just like, we don't know. But um, it is, it's spring fever. And, you know, the kids can just kind of tell. They're kind of like feral pack of wolves ready to devour us maybe that's a little too descriptive but there are days i feel like that but anyways um yeah we're getting to the end we have about a month and a half left of school and it's time it's time for a summer break uh, we need that summer to make us all human again it's how i see it and then back at it again um anyways on the farm we're just having calves left and right it's not been smooth sailing. We've had a lot of illness and lost a couple of calves just through illness, so that's been kind of sad. But that is how it is on the farm. And then, finally, we have got some chicken orders put in. So I'm very excited. We'll be getting chickens at the end of June, which works out great because we have no idea for a coop or how we're gonna do this, but I am getting chickens. If they survive, that's the thing we're going to find out. So I hope they do. I'm very excited. Um, and then, of course, I'm still in the lawnmower saga with my husband. I'm in like round six right now. It's still broken. I keep trying to remind him, but of course, he's worried about calves dying. Understood. And planting because it's we plant corn and soybeans and hay and all that. And it's time, and once May comes, he pretty much doesn't stop go, go, going until it's harvest. I understand why he's worried, but I worry about the yard, and it's going to overgrow. So, anyways, I keep dropping hints to fix the mower, and I will just, I just kind of do my little drive-bys. Like, he'll be sitting in his chair, and I'll just walk behind him and be like, oh, I wish the lawnmower would work. Stuff like that. So, I'll let you know if I get my lawnmower fixed. But that's kind of how it rolls around here. Uh, Easter is coming. I know we're all getting pretty excited for that. We've got a lot of family coming back this weekend. And half stays here and half stays at my uh, sister-in-law's. So we're going to split up all the family. And I have already ordered two cheesecakes from one of my coworkers who makes amazing cheesecakes. It's lemon raspberry and German chocolate. So I'm I'm just, I'm all about the cheesecake. So I'm excited about that. So uh, today's going to be a really nice day, but they're saying now a chance of four inches of snow by Wednesday. So today it's supposed to be 70 and four inches of snow by Wednesday. And like I said, I live in central Nebraska, and that is how we roll here. And many of you identify with that. And some of you are just in a perpetual snow. I don't know, which I wouldn't mind that. But I would mind the fact that I actually still have to leave my house and do work. That part would stink, so. Anyways, all right, carrying on. Um, Karen Meadows, I have not yet sent your Bible. I'm trying to figure out how to send it. So this weekend, I hope to head to the big city and find a way to package and send it. So I hope it'll be coming to you by next week. So I apologize for that. It's just been like, how do I, how do I mail, mail this? Uh, the other prayer journal pins I mailed. No problem to memory frost. So, um... So I will be mailing that. I have chosen, just a minute, I got a drink. I've been singing all morning, so my throat is like, Ugh. So anyways, I did the winners. 
I had to put pumpkins for sale back up again uh, because the one who'd won, she didn't, she wasn't able to get it, which was kind of sad. So I chose a new winner through YouTube Random Selector, and it is Mary Bergman. So congratulations, Mary Bergman. Um, my email and Instagram will be uh, in the description box, so just uh, contact me and let me know. Congratulations. Like I said, I've shown this. I've made it in one of my previous videos. It is adorable. Okay, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat. Oy, oy. And then, and then, sorry, I was a one-act coach. And then I have two winners for this is the day. One, two. I ordered two by accident. Then I got another one, and I'm like, this is the day. Yay! So, the winners for these are Julie Matheson and Linda Warner. Congratulations. So, once again, you lovely, lovely people, please contact me. I'll put my email and my, my Instagram in the message box or the description box below. So, please contact me and I will get the Bible and all that mailed out this weekend. Yay. So, uh, moving on, cross stitch. Did I actually cross stitch? I have been cross stitching straight for two weeks. But I only worked on one thing, and that was my daughter's cross stitch. I've shown this several times. Her birthday is coming up in early May, and I want it done in early May. So I that's the only thing I worked on, and I'm almost done. I have just one little motif left. And then I have some fixes, which I'll explain. But it is. Quaker coffee. It's called Coffee, sorry, Coffee Quaker. And it's the Magical Elixir series, part two by Beth Twist. Heartstring samplery. I just, oh, just falling in love with her stuff. And I'm going to show it now. I'm very excited. I attempted to kind of iron it, and I didn't iron it very good. But here it is. It is almost completely done. And I know the light is not great in here. I am so sorry. But I hope you kind of get the gist. So I just need to finish that little green motif down there in the corner. And it will be almost done. I got off on the bottom. I don't know if you can tell, but it's uneven. So I'm going to add a couple little rows to even the bottom out and then I am going to change out this W when I was doing it I didn't realize she had given letters to make the initials more personal so I'm going to change that W to an N for my daughter's husband's name and T for her I really should sneak in an E for Ella but I'll just do those two so it's very pretty it is almost done and now I'm in love with the Quakers just so pretty and I'm sorry about the light I know it's not great in here I need to get one of those ring lights but ugh, I will wait I will wait so anyways that is all I've been working on for cross stitch now that doesn't mean that's all I've been shopping on I have been shopping and I just ordered something else. Once I knew we got chickens, I may have ordered a Stacy Nash pattern, the the hen keep, chicken keep, something hen keep, I don't know, keep it, keep it hens. I don't know, but I did order that and fully kitted up, and my husband doesn't know. So I did that right after, within an hour after, he's like, fine, we will order some chickens. He ordered them. I was like, I know exactly the pattern I need. So as soon as he was out to do chores, I'm like, boop, ordered. He does watch these, so he's going to be talking to me, I'm sure. Anyways, so then I did order some more stuff, thanks to um, the Huga Stitcher. If you have not watched the Huga Stitcher out of Canada, you need to. Um, she does all kinds of things, all kinds. I love her Mary Marabilia is probably the most by Nora Corbett, but I also love 
this. So I had to order it too. After working on this Beth Twist Quaker, I'm like, well, I need another Quaker. Oh, you can't see that. I'm going to take it out of the package. Um, I got the spring one and the summer one was a Nashville market release. So this is by Lila's Studio. And there it is. Oh, it is. She... When she showed it, she had about half done the last time I saw. It was breathtaking. So I, uh, I'm i ready to start. I'm like, I'm going to start this. This is going to be something I'm going to do. And the pattern is, the way, the way she did the pattern, it's nice and big. For those of us with bad eyes, this is refreshing. It's nice and big. That is how I feel about um, Brenda Gervais' patterns that I've been getting. I don't know what they all look like, but the ones I've been getting, they're nice and big, and they're colorful. Now, these are not colorful. They're black and white, but it's still big, and I just really appreciate that with my poor eyes. So I got the Spring Quaker and the Summer Quaker. Oh, dun, 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 dun. Sound effects. Lila Studio. Isn't that just gorgeous? Ugh. Oy, I cannot wait. Um, the to total stitch count for both of these is in the 260s. 260s wide by about 216 height. And I hope to do both of them. And then hopefully there will be a summer and a fall. Oh my goodness. And fall is my most favorite season. Isn't that beautiful? So, in my op opinion, after working on Beth Twist Quaker, I have decided from now on, I always want a Quaker on the go. You know what I mean. Always have one that I'm slowly working on. Not in any rush. Tristan, my daughter, I was in a rush because I want it for her birthday. But these are just for me. I'm going to go slow. Okay, and then I blame Rachel at Flax and Needle. I blame her. And I thank her at the same time because she's just fantastic. Needle and flax. Did I say flax and needle? Needle and flax. You need to watch her. If you have not watched her, I'm waiting. Um, I've been putting off watching the next in her series about the first lady. She did Martha Washington. And then she released the Abigail Adams. So I'm kind of waiting when I could just sit, watch, stitch, and just absorb and just be ready. So Rachel, when she did Martha Washington, she showed some beautiful patriotic pieces and beautiful samplers. And so I had to order, like I said, the last two weeks. I only worked on one cross stitch, but I worked on ordering. That didn't stop. So I have, in one of my previous videos, I said, I'm, I don't know if I'm drawn to Blackbird or not. Well, that's over now. Um, Blackbird is... It's taken capture of my soul. So I had to order this thanks to Rachel. And I've seen this book numerous times. Numerous times. But for some reason, this time, I was just like, whoa, it's so beautiful. It's so pretty. I have to have it. That's exactly what happened. So, Sweet Land of Liberty, My Country, Tis of Thee, Sweet Land of Liberty, the, of Thee I Sing, Samuel Francis Smith. And this book was published in 2016, and there are still copies around. I don't know when I'm going to start. I have no idea. I just know I love it. And now a new wave of addiction has begun. Blackbird. So now I got samplers. I got the Quakers. I got the Blackbirds. I'm in trouble. Plum Street samplers. Oh. There's so many good ones. All right, so then the next one she showed, I ordered this. This is Old Willow Stitchery, and it is the Our Father Prayer. This is all one over one. I do not do 40 count. 30, this is on 36 count. I don't do that, but I don't care. I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to figure out how I'm going to make this work. I don't know how, but I'm going to figure it out. I do 14 count, 16 count. I will try, I am going to try 18 count and see if I can handle it. But I got some 20 count. Mm -mm. No, that did not work. I got some 28 count. That did not work. 
Um, here's another really pretty picture. Oh, it's so pretty. So, thanks, Rachel, at Needle and Flax. And she's going to be dyeing Ada. She started dyeing Ada. I am so excited. I've been slowly checking it out, but I'm going to wait till this summer, and then I'm going to... Ooh, I'm going to scoop in and grab some. Uh, my uh, orders, I pre-ordered through Keepsakes, thanks to Pam and Steph at Just Keep Stitching. Uh, Stephanie works at Keepsakes in Ohio, which is a local needle shop there. And thanks to those ladies telling me about pre-orders, I pre-ordered some patterns. This one is a Plum Street. Many of you have ordered it from all the floss tubes I'm watching and Instagrams. It is Jesus Loves Me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. I love that song. I sing it to my granddaughter. And this one isn't too bad. It's 142 wide by 150 height, so I think it won't be too bad. I have no idea when I start this. I feel like I need a Plum Street Sampler Day special every single week. But I know the truth. I'm just going to work on what I want to work on that's how I am. I went ahead and got this. I don't know how how to pronounce it. It's from Rosewood Manor Cobham or Cobham House Sampler. I have no idea why I like this, but I do. I do. Um, the quote was adapted from A.J. Balfour in 1848 to 1930, who was Prime Minister of UK in the early 1900s. Interesting. And here is the back. of the pattern. I don't know. I just really like it. Maybe it's the peacocks. I think those are peacocks. I say those are peacocks. So, and it says here, what a desolate place would be a world without a flower. It would be a face without a smile, a feast without a welcome. Are not flowers the stars of the earth? And are we not stars in the flowers of heaven? Just... Ugh, that gave me chills. It's pretty pretty. So, I got that one. And then, of course, I had to get this one because, unfortunately, we all know, those of us who have really hopped into the cross-stitch bandwagon again, those of us who retired but came out of retirement, like me and so many others, I am starting to do this all over again. And... Unfortunately, I gave away all of my cross-stitch stuff 20 years ago, and now such regret. So this time, I'm going to be buried with it. Maybe not. Okay, that's morbid. You know what I mean. But I, I want to do this one. I think I'm going to probably change the colors a little bit. It calls for gentle art, baby spinach, cornflower, and lavender potpourri. Potpourri. Um, but I'm probably going to change the colors, I think, when I ever get to it. It's supposed to be on 40 count, but I'm an Ada stitcher. I will adapt it. And if I don't know how to adapt it, I'm going to ask all of you. And then I did get Starbucks. I'm a huge Starbucks fan. I only get to Starbucks maybe once a month. And then I order as big as I possibly can. Starbucks it is so cute. Plum Street Samplers. Isn't that adorable? Starbucks. And this one is 157 width by 65 height. I think this will go fast. So cute. And once again, Plum Street Sampler, she just knocks it out of the park. They all do. All the designers do. So when I um, ordered from Keepsakes, I got a phone call, a message left on my cell phone to call back because I was teaching class. And call and call back to get my credit card number. And guess who answered the phone? Stephanie. So I talked to Stephanie on the phone. I was kind of like, oh, uh, yes, uh huh, eh, eh, yeah. Eh. I was doing a lot of that. Like, oh my gosh, she's so famous. And I know they say they're not, but to a lot of us out there, you are. You've done incredible things and have gone through a lot in your life, and you've you've just shared your love of a hobby that we enjoy. So I was very excited. Okay, that kind of ends the stitchy portion. I don't have anything else. I just worked on 
my daughter's piece. I'm finishing it today, and I'm taking a get frame this Friday. And I will be mailing all of the winners their stuff, the share away peoples. Okay. All right, so time for Elijah. Um, sorry, by Priscilla Shire. Elijah, of course, is a prophet, prophet prophet in the Bible and I am going to just do day one this time day two next time I'm gonna go slow um, I have found when you try and rush through um, studying the Bible you don't get much out of it so I'm gonna go slow I'm gonna read through this I wish I had somebody to sit here and talk to I don't, so I'm going to rely on all of you to put comments in and kind of help foster and create that um, Bible discussion. And I would love it if we would comment on each other's comments, if you have some good thoughts for the things you've learned or things you previously knew already, please share. I would really appreciate it very much. So, okay, so those who are ready to join, uh, Priscilla Shire is the author of this. I don't do the videos ever, only if I'm actually doing a real Bible, like, not real, but actually I don't even do that. I don't even do the videos anymore. I feel like you don't always need them. Maybe some of you are like the diehard video people. you got to have it. I've just kind of found out, eh, you don't really need it. You can still get a lot of it, out of it. So there is a video to the beginning of each week, but I'm not going to do it. Okay, I'm on page 8, day 1, the real deal. 1 Peter 5.10 After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And this is Priscilla Shire talking now. I was scrolling mindlessly through my Instagram feed one day when a particular image snagged my attention, startled me, sort of grossed me out, to tell you the truth, peeking out from underneath my paw's thumb. You know how you can see something that's a little disturbing to you, a little provocative, and even though you really want to turn away, you somehow can't seem to stop looking? It was kind of like that. Half of the image showed a beautifully poised, perfectly arched ballerina's foot, smooth, elegant, dainty. Her cream-colored slipper fit like a satin glove, along with a silk ribbon woven meticulously up her ankle, completing the classic look. It was everything you'd expect, like a piece of fine art, so pretty, so precise. But then, the other side. And this other side told a much different story, the real story. Directly next to the dancer's lovely, shapely right foot was her other foot, her bare foot. Without a slipper, the contrast was visibly striking. Whole nails were missing. Several of the knuckles, swollen red, were bandaged, blistered, or bleeding. Fragments of old stained gauze remained stuck to oozing sores. Knobs of contorted, misshapen bones bulged grotesquely beneath the skin. And along with this picture ran the following caption or words similar to this effect. Everyone wants the glory, but few are willing to pay the price we required to get it. Well, ain't that the truth? That's Priscilla, not me. Well, I agree. We want the highlight reel, not the practice session, not the years of hard work, not the consistent pattern of sacrifice, not the going over and over again of the same repeated steps and movements, the stretching, the soreness, the getting out of bed on cold, sleepy mornings, the slow, slow walk of patience, whatever it takes to get it right. Truth be told, when we scroll through our social media feeds, we only want to see the ballerina slipper. It's prettier and more palatable. The worn parts, the beat up parts, douse the wildfire of our romantic imagination. Reality is too much for us to deal with. A close look at the hours of preparation, the years of hard work, and the grueling cost required to get there are not what we came to see. So we conveniently ignore that part. If we're honest with ourselves and each other, that's how we tend to read the Bible too. Guilty. Okay. This is page nine. When you think of these Old Testament personalities, what highlights immediately come to mind? Write your thoughts below. So Noah, the first thing I think of is he built a boat for a really long time. Like 120 years he built a boat. I can't even clean my house for an hour before I quit. So I don't know how he did it. Incredible. Um, Abraham. 
I don't know what you think of, but I think about him picking up his whole life and going wherever God calls. That is my washer and dryer, by the way, if you hear weird gurgling noises. Moses, um, all I can think of when I think about Moses, he didn't start his mission for God, really. I mean, like, you're always on your mission for God, but his fulfillment mission till he's 80 years old. I am 50, and I complain about that. Guilty. And then Samuel, I always think of him as that little boy who kept hearing God's voice, and he'd run over to Eli, and Eli would be like, go lay down. You know, go lay down. Don't we do that to kids? Go lay down. Ends up God was talking to him. And then Esther, of course, she was the queen. Um, she was very scared about standing up for her people. And if it hadn't been for uh, Mordecai, her cousin, I don't know if she would have. And then she did end up standing for her people, and she did put her life on the line. So that's what I think about when I think of Esther. Page 10. Now think of someone who's living today, even if it's someone you may not know personally, whose life you admire from afar. What are some of the character highlights you've seen in him or her that impress you the most? And I um, think it's my sister-in-law. She has been through a lot. And when I look at her life and how she's come full circle, and she is a stronger believer for it and just doing incredible things, um, that's the kind of person I want to be. Several years ago, I took on the task of reading the Bible through in a year. Frankly, I found it a bit overwhelming. Wrangling three small children at the time probably had a little something to do with it. Maybe I needed the two-year plan, where I could take it more slowly and digest things a little more fully that way. Yet I distinctly remember when I came to Elijah's narrative in 1 Kings that year, how I felt completely consumed by the startling boldness of his faith especially the one big highlight that stands out from a story, Mount Carmel. So go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. So I've got to find 1 Kings chapter 18. I am searching, and I'm in the NIV Bible, so if you're in a different Bible, it'll sound a little different. That's okay, though. That's how it's supposed to be. And go to chapter 19, and I'm going to read 19 through 39. Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Got my pen. Marking. Don't be afraid to mark in your Bible. In fact, you need to. You need to underline, highlight, write notes, write things that stick to you. Do it. You'll, you'll be better for it. Okay, here we go. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets of Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull, put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. Then all the people said, What you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us. This is how I envision it. Oh, Baal. They shouted, but there was no response. No one answered, and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them, which this part I think is funny. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought, or busy, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. 
And so they shouted louder. They slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom. So they were cutters. Until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. There's no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. So I'm on verse 30 now. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. So they came to him, and he prepared the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. So that shows you how much the Jewish people had strayed. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seahs of seed, which I do not know how big that is, but that would be interesting to find out. Maybe this study will talk about it. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Just like that. Ta-da! It's very exciting. There was lots of action. This is uh, Priscilla's words. So as I was reading, um, you're supposed to list all the elements from this holy encounter that demonstrate the prophet's faith, courage, commitment, and prayer. Um, so he thought he was alone. That's one. He thought he was alone. All by himself. Um... He was up against how many prophets again? He was up against a lot of prophets. 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. So there were 850 prophets he was up against. Okay. Um, I was going to say the courage. It took courage to do that. And then I just find it funny how he allowed them time. He allowed them all day to have their god, which is a pagan god, be a demon, very demonic, allow them, go ahead, you know, light it on fire, do it. And he stayed committed, giving them all that time. It had been I would have been just so like, oh yeah, let's do this. God's going to burn it up. I know he is, but... He gave him all that time and stayed committed to that time. And then his faithfulness. I mean, he just trusted God to take care of it. He prayed a simple prayer, a prayer of just purity and righteousness in his heart. And God answered. So it says, look back through the things you wrote down. Well, I spoke more than I wrote. And then which of them clearly demonstrates his faith at work? His courage against opposition, the boldness of his witness, his keen ability to pray. So you can go back in your Bible later and go ahead and do this. And I, I will later too. And mark F and C and B and P for that. Okay, I'm on page 11. Now with all this in mind, imagine if Elijah were sitting beside you right now. Right now, excuse me. What are the top three questions you'd like to ask him about his memories from that day? Ooh, I don't know. What would I ask him? Number one, what would you ask him? What would I ask him? Number one, I would like to know, did you ever have doubt? I think that's something we all struggle with. I would love to hear what he said. Um, number two, um, 
what else would I ask him? Did you have fun mocking the prophets? It kind of looks like he had fun mocking the prophets. And number three, um, were you also amazed by what you witnessed, what God did? I think I would have been like, oh, snap, he really answered my prayer, because I tend to be like that. You notice how prayers get answered all the time, and you don't realize until like the end of the day, and then you're like, holy snap, it got answered. Sorry, God, thank you. You ever notice that? I notice that a lot. As I think, think yeah. As I think through the converse, conversation I'd like to have with Elijah, I try to picture how he might interact with me. While I'd be all zeroed in on the spectacular moments of the story, I wonder if he'd intentionally point to other things, simpler, more foundational things, even difficult things that made up the underbelly of his journey with God. I wonder if he'd accentuate those quieter happenings from earlier in his life in passages preceding 1 Kings 18, verses that are filled with refining and pruning, and that is so true. He went through such a walk. These encounters leading up to Mount Carmel were precisely where, sorry about that, the Holy Spirit seemed to shine a spotlight for me as I was reading. They captured me. They tell us Elijah didn't just show up out of thin air knowing exactly what to do and exactly how to do it. All that faith, all that courage, all that boldness and confidence and prayer, all that fire didn't just happen. Each of these impressive strengths we see in him had been fortified by earlier struggles, like Moses, 80 years old. How many years was he preparing? During earlier challenges, through earlier forays into trust and obedience. This moment of biblical proportions, high atop Mount Carmel, followed a much less public process that God had begun in him years before. A process that's already happening in you and me as well, which your loving Father will continue to develop through this study, a progression of development that I hope you'll begin to recognize and value more than ever before. This is page 12. I'm assuming you're here with me in these pages because we both want what Elijah had. We want faith, courage, and boldness. Check. A prayer life that pushes back the darkness. Check. Character that possesses an unflinching backbone. Yes, that is one of my goals, to just stand strong. A holy conviction that doesn't bow to popular opinion. And are we not in that time right now? Yes, we are. We want to be brimming over with the fullness of God's spirit and power, brave enough to speak truth to authority with love and grace, singularly focused, inspiring others' allegiance to the one true God, people who leave behind a lasting impact on future generations. I love that song, um, I don't want to leave a legacy, only Jesus. Okay, I'm not casting crowns. That's casting crowns, Tara version, but that... That song really strikes to the heart because you always, I mean, when you're young, you always are like, I want to make sure my kids know that I did this and this and this and this. And now it's like, no, nope, nope. If somebody ever remembers my name again after I pass, I hope they just remember Jesus. That's what we need to hope for. So hard, but it's true. These are incredibly notable aspirations, but the question for us remains, are we willing to do what Elijah did to get what Elijah got? First one, what excites you the most as you contemplate that question? Uh, what excites me the most? I don't know. Are we willing to do? that? That's hard for me right there. Willing. I'm going to write that down. Willing. Um, our church is going through a, a rough time right now. Um, we are down to just 25 of us regular parishioners. And today I tried something different. I tried a more modern little like music worship time with donuts and coffee after. And not very many people showed up. But what I saw today was I finally have a willing spirit and they do too. And I think that that's what God wants. We might not ever have a very big church. Our church may close, but I think God wants that willing spirit. And I'm ready. I've put it off. I've hid from him, but I'm ready. Next question. What scares you the most about it? What do you find the most challenging about it? Honestly, to be willing to do what God asks you to do? Time. 
time. I'm not worried about money. He always provides. I'm not worried about um, giving stuff, but time. I always worry about, oh, I'm so busy. Time. I'm a teacher. Don't you know I don't have time? Time, time, time. And um, that's what I need to give the most. Okay, next page. I don't know. I wish I could talk to you. I wish you and I were all together and I could talk to you and hear what your responses are. So please um, put some responses down so I can read them and feel like we had a Bible study. Thank you. Uh, page 13. You have no idea how I wish I could lean into your Bible study book. See, personal, same thing right now and see how you're prayerfully responded. Then I'd move out of the way and let you peer into mine because right here is where the battle is about to be waged on the thin edge that exists between our eager anticipation about the next level where God's calling us and the prickling fear we sometimes feel about what it will cost us to get there. And I think I just said that. And I wonder if you said the same thing. Fear. In a sentence or two, summarize what each of the following passages declares as being the potential cost of building your faith courage, bold witness, and prayer power. And there's scripture that goes with all of that, and I am going to let you kind of pursue that on your own, and I will as well. In Hebrews 11, I see faith heroes who didn't make comfort their primary life ambition. How might this refocusing away from comfort and toward calling be part of your process? Well, and I'm going through it right now. Um, time. I am so selfish about my time on Sundays, especially. It's hard. But boy, what a joyful spirit I had this morning giving some of my extra time. Um, so that's something for you to think about. Uh, what's going to change for you? What is God calling you to do that you've been running away from for a while? Um, is he asking you to repent and call upon his son's name and accept Christ into your heart and you've been putting it off because you're like, oh, I don't know if it's real, which I did that for 32 years. Or is it something else going on in your life that you need to be bold and step forward and do? Moving on to the bottom. In 1 Corinthians 2, I see a man who was unmotivated by cultural acceptance, indifferent to the approval of his peers, uninterested in pressing others with his own ability. 1 Corinthians 2. I'm going to flip to that really quick. Once again, I have an NIV Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay. Oh, it's Paul. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Oh, I just heard a sermon about this. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise, persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And that is so true. So how might being less concerned with public perception be part of the process? Um, yeah, I don't think I need to say anything. We're all so worried about what other people think about us. We're not willing to stand up and sing. We're not willing to step up and say, hey, I'll, I'll take on youth group. I know nothing about it. Hey, I'll, I'll teach this Sunday school preschool class. I don't really like little kids and they climb on me, but I'm going to do it. You know, we're worried what, about what other people are going to think about us. It's, it's hard, but we're called to do it. In Luke 21, I see Jesus' disciples being challenged not to avoid persecution, but be prepared to face it and be testimonies of God's glory in the middle of it. How might learning to endure opposition be part of your process? Um, I think it builds your backbone. I think, I think you need to practice it in little bits, and I think God allows those little bits of having to be persecuted and to stand up for him. Sorry, my hand is waving. I'm a teacher. I can't help it. Um, through my life, he's built little bits of persecution slowly but surely, and he's gotten me through. And I see per more persecution definitely coming down the road, and I see God's right there. I think he does that. He just, well, we've talked about the potter and the clay, and, you know, we are the clay. He is the potter. And slowly 
He's taking those little chips and filling them in with his spirit and just creating us into what he needs us to be molded into to stand strong for him. In Matthew 6, I see crowds of religious people being instructed by Jesus to dismantle the veneer of pious tradition, exchanging it for real, authentic, fervent relationship with him. How might developing a deeper purity and fervency in prayer be part of your process? Um, this is something I need to work on is prayer. I do pray, but boy, there are some women and men in our community that are prayer warriors, especially some women I know. It's incredible, just the life-giving spirit, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Spirit that just changes them and you. When you ask them to pray, you're just kind of like, I know good things are going to happen. Might not be how I see it, but I know good things are going to happen. Hear me, sister, and hear me good. The process of working towards these goals will not be easy. In fact, I can assure you, it will step on your toes now and again. Yep, but still it will all be worth it. It is the pattern I've detected in the men and women of God whom I most admire. People who live in passionate relationship with him. People who stand strong in the midst of adver adversity. People who experience him in a real and living way. People whose prayers pulsate with power. People who hear God's voice and see his activity. People who are unapologetic about their faith. Let me tell you what they've been doing all these years where everybody else is lacing up their ballerina slippers and adjusting the lighting for their stage social images. They've been in the dark room of development. And boy, she's got a big old list. And I will let you read through that list yourself. Um, just picking out one word. I would say, hmm, there's a lot of good words that would apply to all of us and to myself. Um, I, I think dedicating that first one, that's me. I need to work on that. And so pick out some words that uh, you identify with and let me know about them in our comments. And at the bottom, they've committed themselves to the things God's people do in order to receive what only God can give. It's taken patience and prayer, waiting and endurance. It's taken time. They've got the bumps, bruises, scars, and injuries to show for it. But only those willing to investigate more deeply, like you, like me, will get a chance to see and learn from the processes they've endured. That's what we're going to do with Elijah over the next few weeks. Wow, that's day one. Wow, my mind is already like hurting. So much good stuff. Priscilla Shire, her studies are fantastic. And there's that picture of the toes. If you don't have the book, if you've hung in this long, look at those toes. Oh, yeah, I'm not a ballerina. I was on a dance team, but not ballerina. I did ballet for a year. It was fun but we never were on our toes. So next time, we're going to do day two, just like me. Um, some people mentioned that they were already in their Bible study. Just do your Bible study. Do it at your own pace and enjoy. And if you're interested in what I have to say, yay. And if you're like, I don't really care, okay. Um, but do it at your pace. Do it. Soak it in. Enjoy it. And if you're just hungry for more, keep going. Do it and just enjoy um, God's word being shared through you. I have a weird piece of hair to me notes. Okay. Um, really quick, I just want to end with a prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for um, giving me time today. The time to just serve you and get to work for you and you're opening doors for me in ways I never thought possible, God, like being on floss tube, um, singing out loud at the top of my lungs this morning, something I've always been scared to do and did in front of people. Um, God, you have worked on me, you've molded me, and you've shaped me just as you are. All these lovely ladies and gentlemen who are um, joining me, um, those beautiful people who keep encouraging me, God, and who are doing beautiful works for you that I have no idea about and that they keep secret and only you know. Let them continue to grow in their faith and walk in steps to you. And if they have not called upon your name, Lord Jesus Christ, I ask that they do and repent and ask you into their heart because they'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. And may the good Lord bless you this week. Happy Easter. Uh, good Friday is coming up. 
it seems like a dark day, but really it's a day of joy, and we'll really celebrate on Sunday. God bless. Have a wonderful two weeks, and I hope to see you again.